May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Uh, welcome to another Cuke Audio podcast. I'm D.C. Pooba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, doing our part to help preserve the legacy of Shunryu Suzuki and those whose paths cross his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. Uh, Now, today we have a guest, Stuart Lax. And... um, I met Stuart at Tassar in 1967 when he attended the first practice period. And um, his uh, path took him to many different Buddhist groups. And uh, taking a good look at them, there's um, he's got a website, L-A-C-H-S dot inter-link.com. So, lax.inter-link.com. And it's called uh, Zen Perspectives. Uh, Commentaries on Zen and Society by Stuart Lax. And uh, it's got a really good bio on him there, I think, because he wrote it. Uh, but I don't really know. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to just read the first bit of it. But I suggest you read it before you listen to the podcast. It's not that long. Uh, so it has a bunch of his writings here. Uh, the How to, a method of Zen meditation. The Watu Practice Perspectives and Examples of an Ancient and Potent Chinese Chan Practice. Uh, and then uh, an, an interview with him uh, coming down from the Zen clouds, dressing the donkey ming, means of authorization. Richard Baker in the myth of the Zen Roshi, that's very well known. The Aiken Shimano letters, and when the saints go marching in. That's what uh, there is there. Um, I'll read a little bit of it. Stuart Lax was born in 1940 and raised in Brooklyn, New York. He attended Brooklyn College, part of the New York College, New York City College system, where he received a BA and MS majoring in mathematics. He worked at Bell Labs in the mathematical physics department for a year and afterward in the ship design industry for a few years. He started Zen practice in 1967 in New York City. Uh, That spring, he went to San Francisco because he'd heard that San Francisco Zen Center was opening the first American Zen monastery. With luck and the generosity of the center, he was accepted and attended the first practice period of Tatsahara, their new monastery. He returned to New York City and became a member of the Zen Studies Society. Uh, He remained a member for about two and a half years. Now that's, you know, Edo Shimano's group, or that's, that was at a Shimano's group for many years. And then he went to Maine to study with Walter Nowak at what became the Moon Spring Hermitage. For many years, he was, he was head monk and head of the board of directors and in charge of new members, instructing them in meditation, Zendo Protocol, 
and the ways of the group. Um, anyway, listen, it goes on from there. You hear some things. But he was at a number of other places, you know, in uh, in Japan, Soto, in Rinzai, uh, in uh, Taiwan. Uh, he was at the city of 10,000 Buddhas in Yukai, California. Uh, this is, I'm just remembering now. Um, anyway, that's enough. Uh, so look, after we've had our pause to meditate, let's give Stuart Lacks a call. Oh, I want to say one thing first. We had some trouble um, getting um, <laughs> connected, staying connected. I didn't know what the problem was. And uh, we lost some, and and uh, there's a break there. Uh, and uh, I come on and say, this is where the break is. And uh, what it turned out to be was a, um, a, a USB hub that had gotten loose, gone bad. Uh, yeah. And uh, so um, it took a little extra work on the audio uh, to get this ready, but um, I hope uh, you find it um, interesting. I certainly did. Yeah, he's fun to talk with, and uh, he he uh, puts a uh, hmm, what would you say a uh, and he uses his scientific mind, his math mind, and not just you know believing a lot of crap, and and also he. He holds uh, teachers to a to a higher standard than the uh, members of the group tend to. At least <laughs> for a period, some of them then go, "Hey, wait a minute, there's something wrong here," and then they turn on the teachers and devour them. Oh, hey, yeah. Um, I hope you had a a, a good. Uh, Christmas Day yesterday, uh, and also the day before that, and the day before that, and um, the day after that. Oh, I just want to say one thing here. We had a uh, we have we have a a uh, orchid tree with orchids in pots on in seven pot holders uh, on a, um, a wrought iron tree. You know what these. With these, uh, l with these uh, round pot holders on them, and we've done that every year, I think, for the last five six years, and um, uh, it's got lights on it and little things hanging from it. it it's really unique. So yesterday, uh, in front of our uh, uh, orchid Christmas tree, we opened three presents each, uh, from each to each. And uh, that was very delightful. And then we had lunch with some friends and of uh, various persuasions. And I thought it was really neat because so uh, somebody says, well, should we say something before we eat? Because we're all waiting. And it was mainly Alice's family, uh, uh, founder of this uh, Rick, mm, this uh, non-profit group uh, lighthouse that, uh, that you know helps people uh, uh, recover in recovery and all that, uh, and uh, but she was married to Adano, who's uh, Muslim, and so uh, uh, and her son was there, and his son's girlfriend. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many religions were uh, there. Uh, Probably Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and you know, could be um, Christians too. Um, there's a lot of Christians here, and uh, mainly I'd say the groups uh, not um, hardcore fanatics in any of it. <laughs> but you know, it said, "Well, does somebody want to say something before we eat? Uh, say grace or something." And then Katrinka always says, David, you're, and I say, no, don't look at it, don't, no. Uh, and so Downer did it. So we had, and you know, he asked, well, what do you want me to do? Um, and we say, just do what you do in Indonesia. He's from Java. He's a Muslim from Java. Sotabaya, which is 
the close second biggest city in Indonesia, and it's very close to Bali over there in Java. Anyway, so we had our Christmas um, grace for the Christmas lunch uh, was a Muslim uh, grace. And then uh, I, I knew what they say afterwards. They say, Amin, you know, same as Amen. Uh, so I thought that was neat. And uh, oh, oh, another thing is like uh, we took a taxi over there, you know, to eat. And the taxi driver, you know, I said, uh, Salamat Hari Raya Natal. That's um, happy. Uh, uh, it, it's Merry Christmas. Raya means Hari Raya is your holiday. So Christmas is a national holiday in Indonesia. I think uh, Christians are second to Muslims uh, here in uh, how many there are. And Muslims are 85%. And then I guess. I think you have Christians more, and then Hindus, and then Buddhists. Uh, but there's also, uh, I'm not sure what else. They have seven recognized religions. But anyway, taxi driver, I said that to him, and, and he said, uh, I'm Muslim. Uh, and, you know, Jesus is an important prophet in Islam, so they got nothing against Christmas. They all that. All their problems with each other is just like tribal stuff, you know. Uh, and, um, and you know, people becoming fanatics and saying there was the only way and um, like that. But he wasn't that way. I, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm Muslim. And I said, oh, we're Buddhists. He said, it's the same. He said, they're all the same. I thought that was very interesting. Um, I run into that sort of attitude uh, Quite a bit, but there, you, you know, I'll also run into more strict attitudes. It depends, but there's never any problem. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, end of commentary on Christmas. <laughs> so, um, happy um, holidays and all that to you. Um, all right, so. Um, We'll give him a call just as soon as we've had our boss to meditate. So when you hear the bell, if you have such a mind, hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're ready to come back, hit the bell and we'll be here to end the meditation or whatever. And we'll give Stuart Lax a call. Hello. Hi, Stuart. David here. David. I have to say, I wouldn't recognize your voice. <laughs> but it's been a long time since. It since has. We heard each other's voices. I mean, because I was not around San Francisco, so it, was, it would have been in 67 at the uh, beginning of Tassajara, at the, you know, working there before they started and then the first training period. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, let's see. How long has that been? Uh, 67 would be uh, 33, 56 yeah. years. <laughs> yeah. <Not> wow. <laughs> yeah. David, do you have a, still have, do you have any contact with, there was a guy at Tassajara around that time, uh, Esteban Blanco. Oh, well, he was a Esteban. Painter. He's quite a good painter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he uh, he's one of the many who got the Zen Center through the San Francisco Art Institute, and he he was married to a uh, friend, Fran Blanco, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and he was a really interesting guy, and uh, but you know he um, he got into. Um, 
like Hispanic organizing. And uh, uh, at one point he was, um, I remember he was like in on negotiations with the governor, with some group or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then the the next thing I heard, he was, I th- I think he got in with a bad crowd, is how his parents would have said it, maybe, and um, he disappeared long ago. Because he, you know, I we got on so well, and uh, somehow our sense of humor kind of gelled very well, and uh, it was just. I didn't, you know, to say he got in with a bad crowd, <laughs> he just was such a good, my remember, such a good guy and yeah. uh, had a good sense of humor and quick to laugh and, and all of that, that, uh, uh, it, you know, but it happens. That's what it means, getting in with a bad crowd. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I was just uh, looking at your website and I saw you had a thing on people and, you know, Passing through and passing on, and that, and uh, his name just jumped right out at me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed him, uh, but um, he was gone, and Fr- Fran didn't know what happened to him. I mean, that was after they got divorced, but um, at a certain point, she never heard anything, and he got into a dangerous world. Uh, so, um, hmm. Yeah, uh, too bad. What, you're in New York. I'm in New York part of the half the year and half the year in Germany. My wife is German and she's a professor at Heidelberg. So wow. uh, I go back and forth. And she used to be uh, a professor in Oslo. And so then it was easier because it, uh, it was a more relaxed thing and she had less responsibilities. And so mm-hmm. she would be able to come here, and I would go there. So it was less back and forth for me. But now, with uh, being in Heidelberg, and she's the head of a department and all that kind of business, so she has a lot of, and she's got some big projects going now. So she doesn't have; uh, it's not so easy for her to come here now. So I, she was just here for a month and a half, but most of the time, it's more me going there. How long has that been happening? <laughs> well, we've been together, I don't know. I mean, I guess I met her 14 years ago, So, mm-hmm. but she was in Oslo then. So anyway, I started. we started going back and forth, and then uh, I, I forget how long she's been in Heidelberg now, which uh, I think it's seven years, eight years, so, yeah. So What's her field? Uh, uh, Sanskrit and South, South Asian religions. So she's no a Sanskrit kidding. professor and that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And she wow. did a big, big book on. Um, do you know how the German system works? Where you, you get a PhD, but then if you want to be a get a professorial job, you you get a second PhD called the habilitation. Mm. So it's the second PhD, and it has to be in a kind of slightly different subject. So uh, I think, but she did her PhD. She did something on the Vinaya for women. So a lot of uh, uh, women that are becoming nuns now and this and that, so she has contact with them. And uh, because of that Vinaya thing, I think that's at least one of the reasons why. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to talk to her. That sounds interesting. <laughs> uh, I did a, uh, I've done some Vipassana retreats here. And I, I, the last one I did, God, it was a while back, about four years ago, I think, well, it was pre COVID. Uh, was with a woman who's a renegade uh, uh, in in the system because women aren't supposed to get high enough to be able to do that well, and be just teachers. Well, recently that they've also started, uh, what do you call it, ordaining women. Uh-huh. Outside of the, you know, there's three Vinayas and the, the uh, the one that's in China, so, which would be Taiwan mostly now, so they ordain women. 
the Tibetan, yeah. the Tibetan uh, nuns tradition died. So that's been the big contention. I don't know how it is now. I kind of followed it a little closer years ago because she got involved in it somehow. Um, so that, that, that uh, actually a, a number of non- women and Tibetan women thought they were nuns, but they weren't because they never got full ordination because they couldn't do it. And uh-huh. I forget what the third Vinaya is. But uh, the one that really still is intact and not questionable is the, uh, the, the uh, I think it's called the Mula Savastavad and Benaya, but it's the one that's in uh, Taiwan and China. And at one oh. point, some women wanted to kind of be like, say, they were Tibetans in the Tibetan tradition, but they were going to get ordained in the Taiwanese tradition so they'd be fully ordained. Yeah, but other Tibetan nuns got very upset with it because it was uh, breaking the tradition, and you know all this stuff came up. Right, I right. Mean, you could see all of it with that. So anyway, I I don't know how it's worked out now, but I know Uta goes to. Um, she just recently she went to um, some ordinations in California. There's a bunch of nuns thing, and I once went to with her. There was a nuns. Uh, nunnery, I guess, up in Northern California. Um, and we went up there and, uh, but I think they sold that or because it was such a fire hazard, they had to get rid of it. Huh? Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a, a kind of a nuns something or other in San Jose. If I'm not right, if I remember, we went to an uh, uh, ordination there. And they're very careful of doing it right, you know. Uh, the one I went to, I went to a few with her, but one I went to with her, <laughs> and I thought, Jesus, this thing is really long. And uh, mm-hmm. she said, mm-hmm. well, that's because uh, there was a mistake in it. And it turned out one of the monks, when they do this ordination, they rope off a, a, a kind of an area that's like the sacred area for doing this ritual of or, the full ordination. Mm-hmm. And one of the monks leaned outside the the, uh, the rope enclosure, and so they uh, they started and went back to before he did that part or something. And wow! So that made it long, and I said, "Well, boy, they're really stickless for." Yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, Uta said, "Well." They, they just don't want any, because there were some monks there, too. They don't want monks later to say this is not official because you broke the rule. And Joe Schmo over there put his arm outside the, the enclosure. So that's not a it's it's not a legal ordination. So they, they were very careful about that. They could get kicked in the back on some minor point. They just did it, did that stuff and made up the time and had a longer <laughs> like that, so wow. it's, it's all very. Uh, what do you, I would say um, very careful, careful, and you know. yeah, it's, yeah. It's some interesting stuff, you know. The Thai tradition doesn't have uh, fully ordained nuns; they didn't. But there's a, there was a, a monk in uh, Australia, and they had a monastery down there, and he ordained uh, women. And it was a big thing that we're going to throw him out, but they didn't in the end. And uh, and and he said, "Well, I'm going to do it, and then they can't undo it." So uh, so that thing is starting up in Thailand, but it's it's really quite contested the whole thing. That's gone on for years. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's interesting, huh? But it seems like they are slowly but surely. I mean, besides the Chinese and the Taiwan. The monasteries there, it's like four nuns to every monk. It's mostly nuns. Um, you you mean you you mean throughout the the that um, sect or whatever in Taiwan, there's a four to one ratio. I, I, I you know it may be three point seven, but I mean it's roughly four. Yeah, yeah, that's wow. what they talk about. That's the number bandied around. Yeah, I was uh, in a monastery there, and it was easily four to one. I think it was higher, actually. 
Yeah, wow. I was in two monasteries there, yeah. And there's, um, that's what they were in the two that I was, and that's what I read the story. You know, that's what they say it is. But, uh, yeah. My. Uh, well, I think, they, uh, you know, women and, and a Thai Chinese woman, when they get married, uh, uh, it's not a, it, it's a tough deal because the, um, the mother-in-law looks at the wife as competition. And she goes, she gets more connected to the husband's family. So she essentially is going to leave the family. And so they, and, and then, you know, you're an outsider coming in and you're a competition with the mother and all this kind of social stuff goes on. So I think uh, yeah. a lot of women think it's not a great deal. They'd rather not be married yeah. and deal with their mother-in-law and the, all the in-laws family and all of that. And you're the low, low man on the low woman on the totem pole so wow uh, hey i want to call you back i've got a little interference here in my am okay i just want to get a new a new connection so you just hang on one second right away or uh, okay. yeah right so away I, right away i should hang up then right yeah okay hello yeah Hey, I just spoke to a guy that sounded just like Right, you. <laughs> right. And I can already hear this is a better connection. That's, that's really... Uh, Good. Anyway, what you say about the uh, mother-in-law to wife relationship in uh, China uh, is... Uh, I've certainly heard about that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, clearly... Uh, uh, one of the reasons why there's so many nuns. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's one of the reasons. I wouldn't put the whole. I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about it to put the whole thing on it, but I know it's something that comes up if that's discussed. It's it's certainly a well well known <laughs> phenomenon. Yeah. So, what 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 do you what are you in New York City or where? Yeah, I'm in uh, East Village. Wow! And um, what 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 are you up to? Um, you know, I retired. Um, I was uh, working doing carpentry renovation work in the city, and then some years ago, and uh, I had a partner for some time, and we start. I I really having a hard time with him, and at some point, uh, it just wasn't worth it anymore. So I separated from him and then thought I would uh, take about two two months off or something and join up with uh, one or two other guys that I knew. There was a whole bunch of these uh, uh, carpenter types in the, in the East Village that all, uh, they didn't start out as carpenters. You know, they were something, they went to school and all that stuff, but there was piles of them around. Yeah. And uh, it's one reason or another, it didn't work out. And um, um, I was going with an, another woman before I met Uta, and uh, she was uh, very comfortable, as they say. And so she says, just stop, you know, what's the problem? So I stopped. And uh, and once I stopped, I really wasn't. After a few months of stopping, <laughs> I wasn't in a hurry to start again. Yeah. Somehow uh, I was able to work it out, and uh, so I, I, I stopped doing that. And then I was doing uh, uh, also, you know, I was involved with Shang Yen. What's that? Shifu Shang Yen, uh, he was a, he's a Taiwanese Chan teacher that used mm. to come and go to uh, New York, and, and he'd go around the Far East a lot, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaya. Blah blah, but he was big in Taiwan. There was in Taiwan. There were four big name Buddhist people. He was one of the four. They, yeah. So I was with him for a, a long time. But uh, it's a it's a long story. Um, but um, it was it was too painful to watch him anymore. At least that's my point of view. That um, oh. Well, that, that, you said it's a long story. Go back to the start then, and uh, and I I'm interested in the uh, too painful to watch part too. Yeah, well, 
you know, he um, really was looking for fame and fortune at some point, and I, at least that was my view of it. And he was always talking about selfless, but he was totally the opposite of that. And uh, uh, sometimes he seemed uh, like he'd go to uh, somewhere, Singapore or something, and then like, he used to go back and forth every three months, three months in Asia, Taiwan mostly, and then he'd travel around, the, you know, maybe to mainland, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, whatever. And then he'd come back, and then the, the first, uh, it'd be a kind of a night thing when he came back, and we'd, uh, he'd tell us about uh, what he did and tell, and give a Dharma talk, uh, or supposedly we were going to give a Dharma talk. But I remember that they were getting, you know, there was less Dharma talk, and then he would talk about his uh, traveling around and how well he was received, and he packed the biggest auditorium in Singapore, and and it was like a rock star. But it yeah. was like through all of the stuff, and I had it was really painful to watch it, and uh, um, I just didn't want to be around it anymore. Well, what what year did you start with him? Um, 81, 82. And what year did you not want to be around it anymore? It was about 17 years later. My. So uh, uh, did he do session type things? Yeah, we did sessions, and he bought some property uh, upstate New York, and he, he had a, you know, the Chinese were, are really generous to the Buddhists. It's nothing like the Japanese, um, and so he he, you know, he bought this big property up in uh, outside of Taipei, and was building a monastery there. Um, but all of these guys, they all were building, the, the three other big name people were building monasteries also and Buddhist museums and stuff like that. But uh, um, yeah, we had, uh, in fact, um, yeah, we had sessions and, and that kind of thing. Actually, uh, he had me, um, what do you call it? doing the interviews for the Westerners on some of the retreats. Mm. So I was very close to him, and I was very active. I think I was probably the most active student he had, because I had lived in Maine for 11 years. I was used to doing six, seven retreats a year, and uh, and then I did retreats by myself up there. and. Uh, so I was very used to doing it. There was no one else there that had that kind of experience. So uh, anyway, at some point, uh, he was very helpful to me. And then he asked me, he, he had me doing the retreats. And then uh, when he was away giving uh, classes and that. So I was a very active student there. It was not like um, I wasn't, a, you know, I was just come like Tuesday night and go home. Uh, I, I was yeah. Doing it. Uh, um, but as he became more and more successful, um, that kind of, he became really, to me, it appeared like, uh, he was hungry for adoration, hungry for recognition. Yeah. You know, like a small example of how this played out when we used to have, a, we'd have a retreat, uh, they do call it a retreat, not a session. So we have a, a session, though, but it was a re we call it a retreat. And at the, yeah. at the last night, after at the last night, there'd be uh, one period where we'd sit, and then the next period, Shifu would give a little talk, and then uh, and in the talk, he'd say everyone should give their retreat experience, and everyone everyone has to say something, and it should be two or three minutes short. And he said, if someone really has something to say, you know, then they'll make it longer. They're not going to keep it to the three minutes. But the three, the two, three minutes was a minimum for everyone to say something, right? Yeah. And then he would say, but don't say 
how she flew. I thank you so much for the retreat. It's so kind, you know, that you do this and blah, blah, blah. He says, well, yeah, we all feel that way. So just talk about your, your uh, retreat report, right? Yeah. So then it's eventually someone goes, does anyone want to go? If someone raises their hand, they start. And every time, by the, somewhere between the second and fourth person, and I knew who it would be, so it was just like uh, someone would say, he, he, someone would say, "Oh, Shifu, I just <laughs> felt like you were talking to me," and it was so wonderful, and I, it was just so helpful. It was like you could read my mind, and blah 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 blah. Now the <laughs> instructions, as I just told you, were it, not to do that. Yeah. That he knows that not only would he not interrupt the people and tell them to stop, we said, that's not the rule, that's not what we're going to do, but he would sit there gloating. <laughs> it was really hard to watch, but that's just like uh, some little minor thing. I understand. But that would I be, understand. you can multiply it by 10 or whatever you want, and uh, it would go through everything. Now, this is my view, and yeah. as you know, I've written critically about this stuff. Uh, yeah. There was only very few people there that actually saw that or felt that way. Um, so, yeah. But uh, to me, it was obvious and it became more painful to watch. I just felt like someone that the, I think his family gave him to a monastery when he was 12 or 13 or something like that. And so he was, uh, and he was in mainland China, and then left in uh, after '48, and went to Shanghai, I think, and eventually to tai Taiwan. By the time he was 18 or 19 or something, and then he's been mm. a monk all these years. Um, mm. And then I, it just seemed like you've been a monk this long, and you've practiced this long, and you're t talking about selfless until selfless was coming out of your nose, and yet that's the way it ended up. Um, it was very sad to me. And if you see it, it's hard yeah. to watch it. It's hard to listen to regular talks because, you know, that's not what he is, that he's hungry for adoration, and um, and he couldn't get enough applause, and all that kind of thing. And uh oh, uh, there's a break here uh, due to uh, the faulty uh, port I mentioned earlier. So uh, where it picks up, I'm just leaving it the way it is. I think it's referring to the same person as before, but um, uh, anyway, uh, that's up to you and me to guess. On the church steps and eating out of dumpsters and all that kind of stuff. It's just like nonsense. He had a very weak, very weak uh, body physically stuff. So even the food he ate in the, in the temple that we had had to be cooked very fine. Uh, the winters he couldn't take it all, even inside the house, even inside the temple which was heated all the time. He's wearing big scarves, and hats, and all that kind of stuff. It was just it was nonsense what he was talking about. Mm. But he kind of wrote a biography of himself, like he was a cross between uh, Bodhidharma bringing Zen to the West and uh, um, Matsu. So, it was, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, it was just really sad to me. Mm. But you could see there was a number of things. I can't even remember. There's tons of stuff, though. So it's, mm. it's really sad. I mean, I think all you know, I, all this stuff that goes on is sad in a way. Yeah, it's it's normal. That's exactly right, David. And that's what I feel. It's normal. But no one wants to write it normal. Because they're a Zen master or a Roshi. Or their, or their yeah. uh, Rinpoche, or whatever, a Lama, whatever. So, you know, you even find with Trungpa, you know, people talk about him as saying um, uh, the alcohol didn't affect him. And also, they, they don't admit, but he was a cocaine addict. He was hooked on cocaine at a $40,000 a year habit. 
and um, that's in the 1980s dollars. Um, What's your uh, source on that? Um, the, the source would be the Steinbeck. Do you know John Steinbeck? I think the fourth. He's dead now, and his wife. Uh, I forget her name. It's they, they were the source. But then after that, there was another source which I never bothered with because I had Steinbeck source. I got somebody uh, uh, who can um, I can talk to about that. They have too. a book about Steinbeck, which a lot of it is about that, and uh, you, you know. Some people on the internet got upset over it and blah blah blah. But uh but Steinbeck's wife who we contacted and, and ran stuff by her, besides just looking at the book, asked her about this and that and she, she was delighted that we were doing it. She endorsed everything we wrote and all of that. So Yeah. Well uh the the, the, the um that group's where they're at now is, is not, uh, I mean, there's only, uh, some of them who, are, uh, you know, uh, you know, paint, uh, you know, uh, a, a rosy picture of, of Trunkpa's habit. There's, there's a whole factions of, of Trunkpa's lineage that don't have his picture on the altar. Uh, you know, David, there was a picture. I forget where we got it. I did the book with, I did the paper rather with this Dutch guy, Rob Holgendorn. Somehow mm -hmm. we met, I don't know how we met, but uh, we talk on the phone all the time and we've done uh, this this paper together on uh, not the Tibetan way, the Dalai Lama's real politic concerning abusive teachers. Um, we did that taper together and then I did one on my own in Tibetan Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism enters the 21st century trouble in Shangri-La. But, um, but we, I think Rob found this picture of Trungpa on his, at, on his deathbed. And he's drawn his long, thin fingers, his face is sunken in. I mean, he looks like he's ready to die because he is. And, yeah. Uh, um, he's pretty sick like that picture in the paper. And in the, in, I'm not the newspaper. I mean, the article that we wrote. So I didn't, I thought we shouldn't do it. That it's, um, I don't know, bad form. Or, but then on the internet, I saw some people saying, you know, claiming how he didn't, he drank and he, they didn't mention the Coke, but they admit that he was drinking so much, but that it didn't affect them. Oh well, there's plenty who know it knew it did. <laughs> they were they were very divided on that. Well, yeah, um, and there was one uh, a woman that was uh, apparently uh, alcoholic. You know, that was her specialty in nursing. Yeah. So she was taking care of him, and she said, "This is almost a direct quote. It's, it's very close to exact, but uh, she said, well, but I don't know what powers he had and how special he was, but." In terms of dying, he died like every other alcoholic I worked with. Yeah, no, no, that's clear. Um, People denied um, it, and, and they put it in writing, and they, you know, they... Well, there, there, there's those who denied it, but there's plenty who didn't. I would uh, assume there had to be, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, so like that. But anyway, after yeah. I, I saw some... Um, that kind of remarks at all that anyone did it. I changed my mind and I decided that we should put the picture in in the yeah. paper. That okay, if this is a guy that you think looks healthy, <laughs> I wish you luck. <laughs> yeah, no, he was the worst type of alcoholic. Uh, I mean, in terms of of just his. Uh, uh, the, the, his, the progress of the disease in his health. He was kind and of fast. He was, was young, he, I think. I think he was like 38 or something. He was like, yeah. He was like 39 or something. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny, this whole thing with all this, I mean, the Tibetan and the Zen, I think the Tibetans make the Zen stuff look uh, like kindergarten, actually. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but I take something like Sasaki. Yeah. So he's carried on with all these women and blah, blah, blah. And, and apparently at least some of the monks were, his monks were complaining or said something. And, and I think as he got older, it got worse or whatever. It just went on. Well, more of the women complained and then, and, uh, uh, so they they told them, you know, you have to stop. It's too hard. It's, the women can't don't know what to do with it. They're confused. They're hurt. They're, some leave. You know, the whole reactions to it. Yeah. And he said, um, "Look, having sex with young women keeps me young. And if if you're going to make me stop, then I'm going to leave." Well, of course, uh, they didn't make him stop. Yeah. But I didn't see anyone comment on, wait a minute. So he's putting his own feelings and ideas and whatever before the women who who are getting hurt by it can't even stay with some of them are leaving the training, let's say. And and no one looks at, no one's commenting on that. Wait a minute. It's supposed to be Zen is supposed to be selfless and compassion and all of that. You didn't hear people say that, and it just perplexed me. Um, I remember with Sasaki, I was hearing about his board talking to him about this and telling him to stop it and him. Like twenty years before it became public, but he never uh, stopped. And, and yeah, well, you know, I heard what 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 they decided to do was just tell women when they came. Look, uh, if he comes on to him, just tell him no. Uh, I I think it did bother it did bother some women. I think he was probably more insistent in some cases, in some cases less. That, um, but that, I mean, with in terms of a Zen teacher, that should be the first thing held up. Wait a minute. Yeah. You're supposed to be compassionate. You're supposed to think of other people. You don't put your own wants and needs first. Yeah. It it's it appears to be. Um, uh, for some people, uh, an irresistible uh, opportunity uh, that most men don't get, but they they'll get it if they have fame or fortune. Yeah, well, it's just like Donald <laughs> Trump said. You know, yeah, he said, "Guy, if you're a star, you can do anything you want," and he just put it right out there. You yeah. know, and. Uh, uh, that that's true. Look, I stopped wearing robes at at uh, Zen Center in like around 1983 or something. Except if I went to the Zendo for Zazen, but I wouldn't even wear them to a lecture or anything because I, I was getting too many looks from too many women. It was trouble, and I am. That was a very promiscuous time for me, but I didn't need to have any trouble at Zen Center. Uh, but it very clearly, you know, some, some guys would say, uh, uh, that, uh, it looks like robes are a chick magnet, but it went the other way too. Uh, if women are, uh, powerful, have prestige or this sort of, um, uh, this, this, um, uh, you know, this idea of spiritual knowledge, then, then guys are attracted to them. Yeah, position of power. I mean, I had it too in Maine because I was like, I had a position, so to speak. Hey, tell me about Maine. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, Walter Nowak's group. Wow, you were with Walter for uh, 11 years. My, my. Well, let's hear about that. Um, you know, you should read my paper, Hagiography in Modern Days. Oh, the, the, uh, 
when the saints go marching in, hagiography in modern day Zen. It's essentially about Walter and about and, and about uh, Shang Yen. I'll get all your papers on cuke dot com, and we'll do all that. But um, and I've read I've read a, a, a bunch of your stuff, but um, and uh, I'd like to get it more systematically. But uh, let's hear it now. Well, Walter. Uh, how to say it? You know, he spent, I think, 17 years in Japan. And, um, yeah, and he he was, uh, let's back up a step. He was in the Army in World War II. And I mm. think he was in Okinawa. And he actually got a piece of shrapnel in his eye or something. Um, but he had a friend that was in the Army with him. Uh, a guy named Harry, a black guy, um, who was a lovable man, but was flaming gay. And uh, Walter was also gay. So he, Walter would uh, carry on uh, or seduced or whatever, went with um, what, um, some of the men's students. And there was one Japanese guy, I think he must have gone with two, that uh, was not a student, who was a piano. Walter was a, uh, an incredible piano player. I think uh, this guy was a Japanese, young Japanese guy that he met in, uh, in when he was in Japan. And uh, he was a uh, singer. And somehow, I, don't, I never knew why, but he came back to Maine with... Uh, Walter. Um, anyway, uh, Walter liked men. He had a number of affairs with. I remember the first, time, <laughs> the first time I went up there. You know, I wrote him this and that because I was with Shimano and I knew Shimano was bad news. I was looking for something else. And I wrote to Walter because I somehow I heard about him. And um, so he said, "Yeah, you can come up." So I, I came up there, and then he had a, an old, essentially a New England farmhouse. It was, uh, I would say, very moderate at best. But it was, you know, it was a nice, nice old house. And uh, he told me, and there was another guy. He says, "You guys, the other guy was sleeping in the attic already." And he told me, "Stuart, you go sleep in the attic to put your stuff up there." So I, I did. It was so fucking cold, David. <laughs> it was like mm. the end of January, beginning of February. And I'm, I was in the sleeping bag in the, up in the attic. And uh, I was just freezing. I got up and put my hat on. And I, I, don't know, I think the other guy saw me poking around. I said, well, here's an extra blanket or something. Anyway, so I was lying there and, and I heard the sound. And I thought... That's sex if I ever heard it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know who it was with, but I thought, that is that. And uh, so that was the first thing that I kind of, actually the first night I was there, I kind of knew something's going on. But it, it seemed very quiet and all that. Um, but... Um, he went with one guy or another guy, which would have been fine, but then he went crazy over one man. And the person he went crazy over, unfortunately, happened to be married with two children. And until he met Walter was straight, and he still is straight today. Uh, but even that, you could kind of overlook in a way, but he just went crazy over him. He went like, uh, like you know, a 16 or 15 year old that falls in love for the first time, and uh -huh. uh, and you know, he's jealous of every kind of move, any kind of connection with the guy. Now he has all the power. He's the the leader. Of the <laughs> he's not. So you know, you. Uh, I remember like. 
Yeah, you clean. I got. I was friendly with the uh, this this guy. I was friendly with the wife too. And um, I remember being over there. They invited me over for dinner one night, and so we had dinner. And the two boys went to sleep. They were young, and uh, and um, we hear this. Walter had a little VW Volkswagen. You hear the engine, you know, the car pull up into the driveway, pop, 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 pop. and everyone's really, <laughs> we all get a little tense. And uh, Walter comes in and, uh, you know, he's kind of upset, and I, I really feel, well, I, I better get out of here, and, uh, or I want to get out of there. And apparently that was normal that he would drive up there at night at sometimes not every night I assume um, and spend time with the husband and the boys be sleeping upstairs and the wife would be somewhere else and uh, like that and um, you know once I went to Sanzen that's like I think in Soto they call it Dokusan right but in Rinzai they call it Sanzen so I was in Sanzen, and I think I was, uh, I must have been the cook then, because I went first. So I went first, and uh, Walter started carrying on. He said, um, I forget the guy's name, but he said, why would Joe be friendly with uh, this? I don't want to say names now, that's all. Um why would he be so friendly with this guy, that, that, meaning the one that he was so uh, attracted to? I said, I don't know. I always think this or that, but I don't know why. And he carried on and went on and on. And I just sat there. It went on for like a half an hour, which is quite long for Sanzen. And I'm chuckling, thinking, well, everyone's thinking in this end of all, Stuart must have some experience <laughs> because he's getting this half an hour. Uh, mm-hmm. Sanzen, when all it was, I was sitting there thinking, you know, I should pack my bags up and leave. He's off his fucking mind. And mm. um, that's what it was like, though. You know, one form or another. That uh, it, yeah, you get ostracized if you cross that line. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So he was just out of control, you know. Um, and it caused a lot of disruption in the, in the group. You know, eventually it became so, I thought it was so obvious. I couldn't imagine anyone not, um, anyone not noticing this. But years later, uh, when I, after I had left and then I was picked up a friendship with someone else that was in the group who left earlier and we we were talking, and I, in passing, I mentioned it. And he said, what? I didn't know that. And I thought, uh-huh. I guess this guy didn't have street smarts at all. I was like, well, how could you have missed it? I mean, don't you remember we had these long lunches sometimes, and then Walter and this guy would come out of the house, and they wouldn't even, they'd still be bustling their pants up sometimes, and uh, you know, all kinds of things. It was just so obvious you couldn't miss it. But that's not true. That's not true. You could miss it, and I, this guy missed it. And uh, you know, there was another guy that was there that uh, he liked. Um, Walter liked a certain type too. He liked innocent young people. Like he didn't like me. I mean, like like me as. Um, yeah, there's a thing called gaydar. Right. And that means you can sort of pick up on who's going to like who you're attracted to and who it would be possible. I had the same thing with women. Mm-hmm. I could I could go to a party and just look at a woman for the first time and I would know that we could have sex. You know, if thing. So uh, anyway, Walter had that. Uh <laughs> You know, I remember one time we we used to have a three month training period, like the standard way: three months on, three months off, three months on, three months off. So we would end the the the, the, 
in December would be the end of a training period, like just before Christmas or something. We'd have a seven-day retreat and then a day off and then a three-day retreat, and that would be the end of it. And uh, mm-hmm. and then quite often people would go away for, of course, there's no work up there. It was a whole, <laughs> everything's frozen and uh, and like that. So uh, I'm having this conversation with this guy who... He was really a straight, nice guy, really very innocent in some way, I think. Um, anyway, we're having this conversation, and I say to him, you know, if this thing doesn't serve my purposes anymore, I'm just going to leave. I'm not going to stay here because as long as it, you know, but I really like doing the retreats and uh, what the way the whole thing is, all that, and so it's fine, but if it changes, then I'd leave. And this guy says, no, I'm going to stay here my whole life. I just love it here. It's perfect. Da, 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 right? The next day I take mm-hmm. off to go to New York. And uh, he stayed there. I, I think I went for a month or something. I come back in uh, mid-January now, or the latter part of January. And I don't see this guy around. And no one says anything, right? It's like, it's like he never existed. And some reason I didn't pursue it or anything. I thought, well, that's pretty weird and all that. But about two, three years later, I was down in the city again for a month or so, and this fellow called me. He was he really lived somewhere else, but he he was staying in a friend's apartment. And he says, you want to get together for dinner? I said, yeah. So we get together. And then after dinner, I said, you know, one thing, you remember the last time we saw each other up there, you were telling how you're going to stay forever. And I said, if it doesn't serve my purpose, I'm going to leave. Well, I'm still there. I mean, I go back and forth. I'm still there. And you left. I said, yeah, what happened? And he said, well, I was in the barn. We had a big, it was a big old barn that strangely had incredible acoustics. Um, He said, I was up there in the barn doing something or other, and Walter came in and pushed me against the wall and started kissing me and put his tongue down my mouth. And he left the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Walter didn't read him right. He didn't read him (laughs) right. And, yeah. But, you know, I went back, David, (laughs) some years later, after I left. I left in 81. I think in 83, 84, 85, I I went back to visit. And we were sitting outside talking. And I said, Walter, you know, why don't you resign or something? Because you're dangerous. You know, it's like if a kid has like, uh, you know, he wants to fight and he has a a stick or something, all of these dangers, but he's not... But if you give him a submachine gun, now you you know you really have a problem on your hand with this fifteen-year-old kid like that. And I said you're like that, you know. I said why don't you? I don't understand why you don't go back to Japan, which I think is was stupid of me. To say. I don't think it's, it would matter or whatever. Why don't you go back and you speak Japanese and have another teacher and kind of get your act together more. And he said, you don't understand. I can't, I, you don't understand. I said, you're right, I don't understand. But, uh, you know, eventually he did stop teaching. Sure, not, I don't think it was because I said that, but um, he was out of control. I'd like to get a picture of your trajectory here. You know, there's one thing that did, that I, you know, I looked at your website before you know a few days ago and there was I, yeah. I i i read i just wanted to see what a podcast i'm really ignorant about this stuff so i i want i i listened to two podcasts one was a guy i forget his name anyway i think he was in minnesota and then there was another guy i forget he and his wife or something but the second guy yeah, yeah. okay the second guy he kind of miss he he must have read this paper of mine with about with uh, dressing the this the, the Zen master in America dressing the donkey and bells and scarves. Yeah, the myth of the Zen master. Yeah, or, I 
traced, uh, yeah. go from Mike Baker to Suzuki and Suzuki meeting so in Nakagawa and so in with Shimano and that. But the part that he commented on uh, with Suzuki when when uh, uh, Suzuki stops, he's coming back. It's from your book, actually. I took it. Comes back from to, um, Tassajara and he's sick. It's Everyone knows it's his last trip up. And he stops at San Juan Bautista, I think the name of the place is. Right. And it's right. the last day of a retreat. And Suzuki carries on with Soen. And um, I found it really uh, surprising, for one thing, that he was so enamored with this showmanship of Suzuki, of, of Soen's. And that, and it was in the context, the whole the most all the papers in it was this kind of uh it was clear to me i thought i did unless i really wrote it poorly that it it was against this idealizing the zen master well suzuki idolized so when he made up this thing all he does is travel from place to place and he's helping people he doesn't know he's helping people and he's happy like uh, but no ordinary people are not happy like this and on and on like that you know, he had no idea what he was talking about. So when, you know, why don't you, he, he paints him and he's tuned into these other realms and all this stuff and he's calling out 30 Buddhas and these Buddhas keep appearing and no one knows what they are and da-da-da-da-da. Um, but he was a real person. He had a history. And if you want to look at so when you should look at so one's history of, uh, of his thing with Shimano. And how? And even after that, he never recovered from Shimano. He actually died. Of, you know, he, he was troublesome in Rutakaji. He drank too much, and he played. His, he loved Beethoven. He played his loud Beethoven records. And um, essentially, he was drunk and fell down in the in the shower room or shower stall, whatever they call that, the bathhouse, and cracked his skull. And they found him there dead in the morning. But if you've read mm, the thing yeah. that Suzuki wrote, uh, well, he didn't write it. Yeah, he went. He went on for a few. Uh, you know. Yes, you like you were quoting him. Though. Two minutes <laughs> yeah. about it, and it was a little over the top. It was very much over, and I thought Suzuki. I remember as a down to earth guy. He wasn't one for yeah. hyperbole. At least, that, I mean, not that I was there enough to know, but I was only there for two months or something. But he was, seemed to be down yeah. to earth to me, and the way people talked about him was down to earth. I think some of those those uh, quotes that you have in italics in the crooked cucumber, um, mm -hmm. they're a little. Yeah, he's not doing that, and and certainly um, all these other people in that book were not like that either. The all the other people I mentioned in that paper, that the, none of these Roshi, none of these guys are like that. And I really take offense to that. Like what? That they're so pure. They're so much beyond ordinary people. They're tuned into this real, this other world, uh, and you know, oh, and all well, this kind of stuff. Yeah. The, are you, the, you know, Suzuki was totally. He was just. He. He. If there, there's one thing that that. People say about him, it's just how ordinary he was. Right, right. I said that too, that uh, he's down to earth. But what happened here? And why did you put uh -oh. it in? You put it in your book. So you must have thought it was something special. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, I think you made, made a good point there. I know in the thing uh, there, actually, I looked on your website, and I think there was someone else made some comment, and you... And you uh, and you, you kind of said, well, that's not what he was saying, and being him, me, him being me. So you did it. But I thought, you know, if this guy who is, uh, I forget his name now, that he had, he's on one of the podcasts, he and his, and um, I think they clean houses, him and his wife. That's what I remember about him saying. Oh, Bob Schumann. Yeah. He missed the point. He missed it that it was about this out is idealizing and building these people up in such a way that the, the, it's fake. It's it's and it, it gets people to it intimidates people. It gets people to be marks for them. It, it, emp it empowers the 
the Roshi or the, whatever you Zen master or Chan master, but uh, and, and disempowers the students in that way. So I I really feel I'm quite sensitive to that stuff for some years now. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's not harmless to say it. I think Suzuki was a good guy, David. You know, I said that the first time we had contact together. I thought he was really a good guy, and you know. But then when in this thing, you know, I don't know whether of course he was sick or if he was intimidated by by someone because someone you know was like had a big name. He was a haiku poet and he was the head of Rutakaji, which was founded by Haku and. Um, and all that kind of stuff, and he was a showman. Um, but it, I, I, I thought it was really. I was sorry to see it, and I was sorry that Suzuki talked that way. Yeah. Well. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I put your letter in uh, that you wrote about that, and but uh, you said something to me. Uh, that was I, I sympathized it. with yeah. it. I didn't. I don't see it the way you see it, but. Um, uh you know uh uh you know he dropped by and visited so and then someone was you know he was dramatic right and so he 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 uh you know Suzuki was telling you about how dramatic he was and all that and it says you know he said well well um you know, something like we can't see how he's helping people or something. But anyway, it was just something that went on for a couple of minutes. Yeah, well, when you read it, though, it seems different. <laughs> you know, the printed word seems to have power where, uh, yeah, you know, of course, I, I didn't hear him say it. And then Suzuki, I don't know. I mean, I think he's a good guy. I don't, you know, so I, I the thing is, it was so over the top. And so and and so and was so, yeah. It's like three minutes in his life. Yeah, it's not the only uh, uh, thing uh, he said or did that uh, that uh, I don't approve of. There were many things, uh, but um, yeah, I, I'd agree that that. Uh, anyway, I don't know what to say about it anymore. Look, I want to find out. Uh, where, 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 where did you get this, uh, urge to practice or whatever? Where, where were you born? That's where I got it. To. And, and what year were you born? 40. I'm 83 now. Far out. 40 out. So, what led you to come to Tassahara then? What's your trajectory on all that? Okay. Um, you know, I would just like to say one other thing. I'd be glad to say that because there's no problem with it, David. With Sowen also, you know, he had all this kind of pizzazz and showmanship and all this stuff. And and uh, But when you came to the real problem, now he has this student, Shimano. He, didn't, he was terrible with it. Aiken warned him about it. Um, another guy that was in, someone that was in Shimano's group went on his own own dime, as they say, flew to Japan, went to Utakaji, because he had gone there once before, and so he knew someone a little bit, and told someone, this is going to blow up, you better you know, do something about him. Someone didn't do anything. He never did anything. Even in 83, when he visited New York, and there was all these devoted students who I couldn't believe stayed with Shimano all those years. And he pr said that they wanted him to say something to mitigate his power, to mitigate this all this hype around Dharma transmission and lineage and all of that stuff. And he says he would. But you know what he did? Zero. He didn't do anything with it. No public. Nothing yeah, well, uh, public. Uh, look, Aiken, Aiken talked to him in the 60s before Shimano even went to New York and told him terrible things Shimano had done, you know, coming on, uh, signing up to work with w women in the mental hospital and seducing him, and a letter from the head of the mental hospital saying, you know, it was the worst, it did, the most despicable behavior he'd ever seen. 
uh, and Aiken went to Yasutani and so on, and they just pretty much told him, oh, don't bring that up. Well, Yasutani uh, said that it was, um, he, he, Aiken said Yasutani cared less than so on, if that's how. But he also said so on, and I brought it up with Aiken again, and later he denied it. But I said, well, when I, I first met you, Aiken, I brought this up, and, 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 uh, oh. Oh, yeah, and he said when he went to Soen, so because he wanted to have Shimano shipped back to the U.S. He's going to go to the embassy and voice a complaint to whatever. And he said, this is what I remember the first time I mentioned it to Aiken. He said, well, Soen told me if I did that, he would cut me off, and then I wasn't ready to end my training. And I thought, okay, yeah, I can sympathize with that. That's you know, he had put in years already and wanted to keep going with it, and fair enough. But I brought it up some years later with him, and he denied it. He said, no, he never said that to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I wasn't clear when he actually said it, David. Let me back up a foot. Whether it was Soen or Yasutani that said if you do that, I'm going to cut you off. That's probably Yasutani then, because that's who Aiken was really working with, not so on. Yeah. But that's what, and then the second one, years later, when I brought it up with him, he said no. He he denied that. But, you know, David, have uh, you, remember when that thing came out, the Shimano archive? Yeah. The guy that put that together and really did a ton of work on it, a real ton of work, was this guy, Kibutsu Malone who was a bit of a wild card himself. But anyway, he put a lot of work in on it. But anyway, I helped him. So I was on the phone with him conservatively four or five times a week when that thing was being... Wow. Yeah. But he did, it was his thing. He did all the work. But I was with him all the time with that. And um, there was some funny money involved with Shimano, all this stuff. But Soen never did anything. Yeah. But so that's why when I read this stuff with Suzuki, and again, I always think he's a good guy, he's really a good guy. And I wonder, yeah. Um, but it's it's fake. It's fake and it's misleading. This is supposed to be about seeing the truth and all of that, and it's a hustle. I don't think Suzuki means it to be a hustle. I'm not even sure he's doing it consciously to build up the tradition and the lineage and the title and all that. I don't think he's conscious of it, but that's what it is. That's what it does. Yeah, there's lots of that. Um so how did, what led you to to Tazahar? Oh, so what led me? Yeah, so it was nineteen nineteen sixty seven. But I I was in Brooklyn then. I was working at uh, I think at Bell Labs as a, as a scientific programmer, and uh, ah, uh, you know, none of my friends were into programming or that. They were all into artsy fartsy stuff and music and jazz and da 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 da. So I was living like a and I was uh, married but the marriage was I would say rocky at best. It's not that she was did anything to me or I did anything to her. We just so both so unprepared for it. I was twenty seven years old. We were just unprepared and she was twenty six or something. We just so it was really unfortunate, but um, anyway, uh, so I was having a you know a hard time. It was a rocky time, though. You know, there was all the drug stuff around, and the fucky sucky was all over the place. <laughs> Everything was going on, and I felt on very shaky. <laughs> I felt on very shaky ground. And I remember. Yeah, what year is this you're talking about now? 1967. Oh. Yeah, and uh, I went to a bookstore and I picked up a, a, a book by Sartre. I forget the title now, but 
it talked about this kind of this inner kind of where you, you real your whole being is being rattled, and there's no place to put your feet down, and it's. I thought that's not so far. It's not true. We also had this thing too, but anyway. So I decided. I I remember saying, "quote." I'm quoting myself. I have to do something now. So I started to look because I didn't like psychology so much. So I didn't want to go to a therapist because I didn't trust. I just didn't like it. I didn't never resent it resonated with it but I did like the religious stuff which I always was involved with or liked and uh, so I, I started going to some places and I met I, there was a guy I knew that was uh, a Swiss fellow actually who, who was and he um, he had been around this religious Eastern religious stuff so I called him and uh, we met at a drug farm in Vermont, actually. And I called him and said he knew these different places. So I would go with him to a Hindu guy on the Upper West Side and there's someone else here and someone. And somehow it's the simple thing of, well, did you think of working in the yellow pages? It didn't occur to me. But then after we went to a few of these Hindu guys, I said to him, oh, his name was Jim. Jim, do you, uh, is there any Buddhist guys around? So he took me or sent me to the first Zen Institute, Mary Farkas. So I, right. That's right. So I started, uh, but when you first started going, because you didn't know how to sit, you didn't know left from right and whatever. And, uh, so you sat in the hall rather than in the Zendo. So myself, and did you ever meet a guy in your travels, Don Scanlon? He left Shimano, right. and he went to Sasaki, but he was out on the West Coast. But I thought you may know him because uh, he was like uh, uh, an ex-boxer. He got knocked out by Sugar Ray Robinson in Florida. Wow. Yeah. He was ranked fifth to seventh, and Sugar Ray Robinson knocked him out in the first round. He said, I was standing there, and the next thing I was looking <laughs> at the ceiling. I didn't know what hit me. So, wow. Yeah. But anyway, Don also was in the in the hallway. The two of us, so we were we'd sat there and uh, whatever, whatever. And then we both lived in Brooklyn, so we would take the train down together. And so you get friendly, you know, just sitting together, you get friendly. It's sort of like magic in a way. But then I wanted to do more, so that's when I found out about Tassahara. So I had a friend that. And, uh, anyway, so we met. I, I knew someone in Minneapolis, and he was there, so I met him out in Minneapolis, and we drove to San Francisco, and I, they were going to do I don't know what. I, one of them I know was just going to drug and get high. The other, I don't know what they were going to do, but I was split from them in San Francisco, and I, I went up to the to the um, Zen Center, and and. Somehow they took me in, which was really nice of them. I just came in. I didn't realize. I had no idea what was going on, David. And they said, well, who are you? We have 500 people a week coming here, you know. And I said, well, I don't know. Just take me. I need it. And so they did. And then, um, But I was there every day and doing the work for them and doing whatever, whatever. And Well, nobody was rejected. To who came to Sokoji, uh, you you went to Sokoji in the city. Yeah, it was across the street from the. the, 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 the I think it was a, an old synagogue that was the Zendo. No, it, it was the synagogue. Yeah. Sokoji was an old synagogue. Yes, that's and that's. So uh, I was a, at the. But they had two or three buildings across the street, and they put me up there. People were moving in. It was uh, like an informal. Zen Center did not control it. Individuals had rented them. But uh, I think Claude Dallenberg might have been sort of coordinating. You know, I don't remember Claude Dallenberg. The guy I remember was uh, Philip Wilson. And he and I got friendly. In fact, the day that he said we'll go. So this is uh, 
67. Do you remember what month? Probably April. Yeah, sounds right. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I remember the, the second night, I think, I was there in that in that building across the, one of their, like I call them, one of their flop houses. But it, it was really nice. And I'm sitting on the floor in the living room or something with Philip Wilson, who was wearing like a, a vest that's like a wool vest. So he looked like the gladiator in the thing, you know. And uh, yeah. he says, well, sometimes, you know, I go crazy and da 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 And I'm thinking, oh, fuck, I'm sleeping next to this guy. And he goes crazy sometimes. And I'm thinking, you need like an elephant gun to stop him. Right. I sure hope he doesn't go crazy tonight. But he, but he, later I brought it up with him. I said, Phil, what did you mean about going crazy? I really got nervous about that. And he said, well, something he meant crazy over women or some particular woman. And so he just called it going crazy. But uh, I took it as going crazy, like, uh, you know, because he looked like this warrior monster. I think he played football in the Rose Bowl in Washington State, the University of Washington or something. No, no, he went he to did. Stanford. Whatever. He said he was a football player. He was a right guard at Stanford. And he he got CTE, cranial thrombosis, you know. It, he got that brain thing oh, that really? kills a uh, football player. Yeah, and and it did make him – it did totally change his behavior. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and he eventually uh, – I mean, J.J., who was his wife – Claims that he he actually died from it, uh, but um, I talked to him. Uh, you know, I told him some of the things he had done le- many years later. And first, he yelled at me, "I'm a liar," and this and that. And then he came back and said, "Did I really do those things?" Uh, and uh, yeah, it was sad, but um, uh, he was a fierce. Uh, opponent on the line as an offensive right guard. And, uh, it said he almost became all American and people thought he should have been. But, uh, he, he told me he'd end up in the hospital after every game for a day or even two. Because of his head felt rattled or something, whatever. Oh, uh, yeah, because he was banging his head there. And he also said he, uh, he that he on the fourth quarter he'd be floating above the game looking at it, couldn't feel a thing. So uh, yeah, amazing. Yeah, I know my friend that this guy Don Scanlon that I asked you about. That was a boxer. That, that, that name sounds so familiar. Yeah. Yeah, he was one of these guys. Like, if there's something that's the 180 degrees away from being an intellectual, that was. Pat, Don. <laughs> but he had a very, very big heart. But uh, sometimes it would be annoying. He'd be so un, unintellectual. I mean, it was just too far, like too extreme. But anyway, he was punchy at the end. The last time I was with him and we went around the city one day and we went to some boxer's bar in the city somewhere that he knew these characters and uh, we were on the um, train station, uh, you know, the underground in New York. And I, I said something about going to Philadelphia or Pennsylvania. And he said, oh, yeah. He says, I fought JoJo uh, in Philadelphia in 19th. And then he stopped in the middle and he says, I'm really punchy, aren't I? Mm. And it was really sad, you know. It was just... Um, he was really punchy, though. I wonder if uh, boxers CTE and is different from football players. It's repeated concussions. Uh, uh, eventually, you know, uh, granted, uh, uh, and you know, there was this African doctor that sort of discovered it and named it and had the whole NFL after him. Yeah, I would think uh, so. And, well, he can't stop it. It's a multi-billion-dollar yeah. business. Uh, you know. uh, yeah, and, and people still go in it. 
you know, Sports Illustrated once had a um, an article on on uh, athletes, and so they had a football players, basketball players, and, and baseball players. One of the baseball players. Do you remember Warren Spahn? Yeah. Pitch sidearm. So that arm that he used to pitch with was essentially paralyzed. It was useless. And then they uh. had some basketball guy on a, a guy was like seven foot two and, you know, strong and all of that. And he says, you know, I have a three-year-old or a two-year-old. He said, but I can't carry my baby anymore because, you know, his heart right, who knows what. And, but then they interviewed some guy who was like a lineman or something on some championship lineman. And he and, and the, the, the thing they would do is they always ask, "Would you do it again, knowing that this is what's going to happen?" And most of them said no, but this guy said, "Yes, it's worth it." He says, "You can imagine what it feels like when they, when we line up on the scrimmage line, and there's a hundred thousand people in the audience, and it goes dead quiet." He says, "It's just, it's worth it. I would do it again." I heard um, Joe Montana and Dwight Clark interviewed by a woman. And at some point she said, oh, it just must be so exciting and incredible to be out there doing that. And both of them said, no, it's terrifying. And, you know, they made it very clear it is a terrifying experience. And they did it because they they were really good at it and could, but they did not paint a rosy picture of it. Yeah, well, so out of these, in that article, I think this football player, this lineman, or whatever he did, was he was the he was the one that really he just ate that that excitement up. Uh, the others, kind of, yeah, you know, well, maybe no. Especially the basketball player, they couldn't pick up his two two year old little daughter. Well, we we had a guy in Zen Center, Robert Lytle, who had serious serious neck problems and and nerve problems from high school football. I bet. Oh, wait a minute. I want to go back. I'm trying to get the trajectory of your spiritual path here. So I wanted to go to to the to the. Uh, to Cal, to, to, I didn't know was, uh, I didn't know what Tassahara was. I didn't know anything about the Zen Center, but I heard that they were starting a monastery, and it was going to be the first one in the America. Which that didn't mean anything to me. It was just that they were starting a monastery, and I felt like I really need this thing. I'm really desperate, so I decided just to go out to California, but. At the same time, my best friend in New York was going to Minneapolis, where we had I had met some people before in Mexico two years before, and we stayed with uh, these guys in in, uh, in in Minneapolis for a, a week or so, and then we drove across country, which was a whole crazy trip. As that was the summer of love, so it was all this nonsense on the road, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh-huh. And then uh, when we got to San Francisco, David, this is really the truth. I, I, we pull up to some guy and we say, you know, we're going to try and sound hip. We says, hey, man, where's Hey Ashbury? And the guy says, it's uh-huh. around the corner. <laughs> you know, and here you see it in New York. Sometimes people come in from Jersey and they say, hey, man, where's uh, West 4th Street? You know, you, you go, oh, another uh-huh. snow from Jersey. Uh-huh. But we were... Well, you know, that's, we didn't know what we. But anyway, we. The funny part is, we ended up around the corner by just mistake. I mean, when we went over the, the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, I was sitting behind the guy driving, and he kept. He was totally stoned or something. He'd fall over the steering wheel, and I would grab him by the by the shirt collar in the back and pull him up. And that's how we went over the <laughs> Golden Gate Bridge. Lucky we made it. Good Lord. In in Montana, I told them we were in a rainstorm. And he was always high in that. I just didn't want to get killed. And uh, I said, Danny, uh, pull over there, that garage. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting off. You know, it's 
it doesn't make sense for us to fight, and you're not going to change, and I'm not going to change. So you guys go on. He says, you're going to get off here? We're in the middle of nowhere in fucking Montana somewhere. And I said, yeah, it doesn't... He says, no, I'll change. So I said, okay, I'll stay with the... But nothing changed, of course, you know, like 10 minutes later. Yeah. yeah. The same old thing, but it didn't make it... You're, 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 you're staying in one of the apartments across the street. Yes, from- I went to the, you know, I, from Haight-Ashbury, I asked someone, how do you get to the Zen Center? I knew what the address was, and I don't know, I went by car, cab or something, or they drove me over there maybe, and then they left, and I was with the Zen thing, and, I, you know, it was very nice. For some reason, they put me up. I never went to a hotel or anything. They put me up the first night. I walked in cold. And uh, yeah, and uh, so they were very uh, generous. This even doesn't really capture it. They were very generous to me. I mean, that's the way I felt. So they never said, "Go, go find a hotel and uh, come around, kid." You know, blah blah. It was not like that. Yeah. Oh well, I think we have for the days. Yeah, for the days. Yep. (laughs) But they ain't the days now. They ain't the days now. So I started, <laughs> that's what I did. I started hanging out and this and that. And then, uh, you know, they had something came up and we went to Tassajara and they worked there and whatever. And then somewhere along the line, I remember uh, I met Baker. And uh, I never took the Baker, to be honest with you. You you met who, Baker? No, I met, I met Baker. And, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, one time we were in Tassajara and it was like, I don't know, like six or seven of us coming back to to, to the San Francisco. And we were all in this van, I think. And it was when the Monterey Music Festival was on. Monterey P- uh, Pop. Uh, the, the Monterey Pop Festival. Yeah. 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 And Baker says, OK, we're going to the let's go to the festival. I so, thought, all right, you know. So we go to the festival and we park and they get, we're getting out and Baker says, hey, look, once we get up to the gate, I'm going to hold up the tickets, but I only have two tickets. So the minute we get up to the gate, you guys walk in, I'll be holding the tickets up and then disappear because it's going to be mobbed. I'll never see you. And that's how we all went with Baker's <laughs> two tickets and he says they're all with me and he held up his two tickets and we all walked in and kind of disappeared in the crowd and uh, somehow it was, that was back then like you know it was like getting right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. how many of you were there I remember like six or something like that you know but yeah I was, including him or not including him you know, I don't remember that well, David, but it seemed there was like a group of us, you know, it wasn't two. Yeah. Yeah, so it was something like six or seven. Yeah, I love that story. I love that story. I have that in Tass. I'm working on a book called Tassahara Stories, and I have it in there. Well, that's a true story. You're hearing it from the, uh, <laughs> the devil's mouth. I just, I'm not sure on the, and then I, I uh, you know, and then they, Oh, that was the other part. And then they, at, I was I went back to New York to, to see my wife for a little bit, and then I came back to California. And then, again, I was very active with the center. They put me up, and uh, and then they you had to write something about applying for Tassajara. And I remember thinking to myself, "quote I could bullshit as good as the next person. This is not going to be a problem." But so I thought Tangario was like that you write something while you want to go. <laughs> so we're driving down, and no one else came. There was Stanley White was supposed to take a bunch of us, but no one else showed up except me. So we start uh-huh. out, and Stanley says, was Philip Wilson or Stanley? I just, who was the most, that football player was? Philip. Philip Wilson, yeah. So Philip says, well, you want to see the uh, buffalo herd in, in Golden Gate Park? I said, I'd love to. I never saw a buffalo herd. <laughs> so we stopped to see yeah. the buffalo herd. And then we said, then we're starting to drive down. So says, do you want the scenic route or do you want the quick route? I said, I'll take the scenic route. 
So we start going on the scenic route, and then we pretty much we stopped off and you know looked at this and that and uh, all that. He knew the, knew the stuff really well, and then uh, we're right starting to go up that road, or maybe we just started to go up the road to Tassajara. And I said, by the way, Phil, what's this? Uh, what's this bullshit with the Tangario? He says, well, you sit for like three days. I said, what? <laughs> he says, you sit for three days. I said, I could explode at him. I said, Philip, you know, I'm new to the city. I never sat even more than two periods. Now I'm going to sit three days. Are you crazy? La, 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 la. You know, he, <laughs> he says, cool it. Don't worry. You know, you'll be, you'll be fine. I said, I'm not going to be fine. La, la, la. And he, he cools me down. And then he gives me a sitting cushion that's beautiful. It was made in Japan and had like, I don't know, 14 pleats around the thing. It was just a beauty. I said, Philip, I can't take this. This is just from Japan. I, yeah, I'm, I'm just new at this stuff. He said, no, take it. I want you to have it. And I'm saying, no, Philip, I can't take it. It's too beautiful. It's yours. And you carried it all the way back from Japan. And uh, uh, uh. He says, just take it, and I want you to have it. So I said, okay, I'll take it. I, so I had that. I think I still have it, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, it's, it's, the seams are all ripping open, so the K-Park is popping out in like eight places or something. But that was very nice of him. So you were there. So you did the Tangario, uh, and and uh, you were there for the first then I stayed the first month, and I left after the first month. I didn't stay for the post. Uh -huh. yeah. But I signed the, uh, you know, the paddle. And they used to keep it in the attic of the, I don't know what the buildings are like now. But uh, everyone that was there for the first month signed uh, the paddle that this was the first uh, first training session that they had there. So. Yeah, it was the first session. Yeah, so my that's uh, right. Everyone that was in the so I did that. But you know, with that Tangario, David, it was very interesting that if you're writing about that, how many people left? How many people left? You know, I would say twenty people left. Twenty five people left. Yeah. Right. The 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 first practice period was set up. In two sections, there was a, many people came just for one month, the first part. And, uh, some people came only for the second month. And then, uh, uh, a lot of us were there for both months, but it was the only time that ever happened. And it was the only time there was one in the summer. And, and there was a session. When you say that's the only time that happened, you mean coming for one month? Yeah, yeah. But it was, you know, it was um, uh, um, after that, the practice periods were in the, you know, in the fall and the spring, or fall, winter, winter, spring. Uh, but, yeah, that was the first one, and you were there at the first session. And, and you all signed something. I don't know where it is. I don't have it. I don't have a copy of it. I was told it was in the attic. It was like a wooden paddle that was maybe three, four inches wide and two feet long, maybe 30 inches. You mean you all signed your names on a wooden paddle? What sort of paddle? What was it for? Beats me. I, you know, I was just, I didn't know anything that was going on. I just said, okay, oh, I'll funny. sign it. They say sign it, you sign it. You know, it's like. Shit, white colors, sir. You know, it was like that. Huh. And I wonder what attic they're talking about. I don't remember now. Huh. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. But Esteban, I think, may have been there then, too. Yeah, he was there. And there was another guy. I don't know if you remember him. He was a big, heavy set fellow that used to work for the post office. And I think he got caught dealing LSD through the post office while he worked there. So they didn't arrest him, but they threw him out of the post office. And he he, he was eating some of that, um, uh, what do you call it, 
macrobiotic bread, which was kind of really a little hard sometimes. Yeah, the unused it. Yeah, and this guy cracked his front tooth, and he turned around because he was sitting next to me, and I see his cracked tooth, and he goes, yum, yum, with a big smile on his face. <laughs> and we called him yum, yum. Esteban and I used to call him yum, yum. I wonder who that was. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And there was another, I see a picture of people that were there, and there's one guy who was very tall, and I think he had his head shaved, but he had a big black beard. And I thought, <laughs> red beard, well, the painted the photograph. Oh, no, he had a red beard. Red beard, that's Bob Watkins. It's uh, black and white, so it comes out like dark beard. Is, did that guy stay with the center? Because he said, you know, I hadn't had a watch no, with me. No, no. Because they made him in charge of the work or something. And he, he said, I haven't had a watch for years with me. And Yeah, he was the first work leader. Yeah, that's Bob. That's Bob. Can you hear me? That's Bob Watkins. Uh, he had come in in about February with Sandy, his, his wife. and. He stayed through both practice periods into the fall, and then they 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 left. Uh, but they didn't. That's the way they'd planned to do it. I mean, Dick was really mad at him and didn't want him to leave. But he said, "Well, we've got to move on." And uh, I've got a ton on Cuke dot com about him. He's very interesting. A great guy. He went on. I think he was a paratrooper. He said or something. Is that true? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was. He was, and he got a terrible knee injury in the Korean War. He also did um, a number of years in uh, for armed robbery before he came. Uh, and uh, that's how he got into meditation, was in prison. Oh, someone ran a meditation uh, group there. No, he figured it out himself. Uh and, you know, like five years or something. Uh, and he just meditated all the time. And, uh, then, uh, he, uh, anyway, I can tell you a lot about him, but it's all on cuke.com. Bob Watkins. He went on to be ordained by Kobunchino. And, you know, uh, he, his home was the first Taos Zendo. And I would visit him. Oh, I visited him many, many times in Taos. Through the years, uh, uh, great guy. Yeah, he seemed. Uh, yeah, I really liked that guy. He seemed uh, really oh, solid. Yeah. yeah, he was. He was. Yeah, I ran a, a group in prison for two years. Uh, were you in prison, or you were coming from out? No, I wasn't. I would come in once a week. But where was that? Upstate New York, a Beacon Correctional Facility. So you were there for that first month, and I certainly, uh, I remembered you. Well, we worked together something, and one time when we were working, replacing the drain pipe for the toilets or something, and you were down in the ditch there with the cracked water pipe or something, and someone flushed the thing, and your hand had ended up with water and turds and all that stuff, and I remember you screaming or something, and I mean... It was, I mean, it was kind of funny if it wasn't you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anything else you remember from back then? Uh, I, did, I do remember one thing. It was the first time that I really sat. It was the first time that I felt that I really had, had sat. So I started in April at the First Zen Institute. And I used to come for one period. They used to have two periods a night. I would leave after the, the, I think the periods were 40 minutes or 45 minutes. So I would get there mm -hmm. early and you, you know, read stuff in their library or whatever. And then we'd sit and I'd sit the first period. And then uh, I would leave um, and Scanlon would stay, Don Scanlon. And then later, I think I got a little used to it. So sometimes I would stay for both periods and we would take the train down. And on the weekends, um, we would uh, go out for lunch after and whatever. 
Scanlon used to come up in the morning to sit with them. This is, he was, when I said he had heart, he lived in what's called, uh, it's the end of Coney, it's the end of Brooklyn, and you go to Coney Island, and then it, it turns, and there's a whole other area out there past this. So you have to take a bus to get to the first, last stop on the train and that. And he used to do it like 5.30 in the morning or some crazy. He'd, he'd get there, and then sometimes the people living in the building weren't up yet, so he didn't get in. But he didn't stop. So he had that kind of hmm. gumption or something, right? But uh, mm-hmm. So it, you really had to respect that for him. And that's before you came. That's before you came to Tassajara, right? Yes. Yeah. When I came back from Tassajara, I called uh, Don. His name was Don, but they called him. He called himself Pat, or his name was Pat, and they called him Don. I forget which one. And uh, he wasn't at the First Zen Institute anymore. I said, "Where are you? You didn't stop sitting, did you?" And he said, no, he says, I could go over to Shimano's place. It's the real thing, this Japanese guy and like that. Right. So he really, he, right. I think he took to Shimano and I didn't trust him. You know, I, my wife used to, I was married to another woman at the time and she used to ask me about it. And I say, Helen, I don't know shit about it. You were asking, are you asking me about like climbing Mount Everest? I could just, you know, I, I can't do it. So I said, why don't you come when they have uh, Thursday night, you can ask a question or something, or you can go for an interview. So she went. <clears throat> so after we finished sitting and this and that, and there was another guy, I had a, a little car, we were going to drive down to Chinatown and have a bite to eat. And uh, I said, well, how'd it go? And she says, well, it's a little strange. I said, you know, I have trouble sitting. My back hurts. My leg hurts. It's, it's all like, you know, day one stuff, right? And um, Shimano asked her, why did you really come? What do you really want here? And she smelled the rat. And when she said it, I smelled the rat, too. I thought, this fucking guy, you know. It's baloney. You know, he was like doing something. And um, anyway, she didn't come back, and uh, I, I continued for a little while, but I never trusted him. Um, is that before you came to Tassahara? No, it was after I was in Tassahara. So I was in Tassahara, and then when I was there twice in the one summer because I came back once to visit her, and then I went back for the training period, and then I came back, and then I was going to go back to the First Zen Institute, but uh, Scanlon had gone to Shimano's thing. He says, oh, this is the real thing, a Japanese monk, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I started going there. I thought, yeah, it seems mm-hmm. that I didn't... There was something uh, I felt funny about uh, the First Zen Institute when, when Mary Farkas. So I I guess I got taken a little by the robes and the thing, and he, he, yeah. So you say there was something funny about the First Zen Institute, so you started... No, it was something funny about Shimano's thing. Oh, yeah, all right. Once I started going there, and then... After I've been going a few months, my wife says, started asking me questions about it. And I said, just come Thursday night. You'll have a meeting with him. He knows the stuff. I don't know. Any- yeah, I'm new at it. I don't know anything. I wasn't going to try. And- I-, I was new. You know, I did the stuff in, in yeah. Tassajara, which and that was very important to me, though. That it was the first time I really sat one day uh, in that uh, from uh, after breakfast to lunch period. I really got mm-hmm. into the sitting and just was able to sit and, and you know it was not that it was anything but it was like it was like my idea of sitting and it was the first time and uh mm. you know it just was it was it was wonderful you know it was so um oh so you're finally getting in touch with this a little mm. so that and that was the first time and I had been at it for a few months already Huh. And uh, 
So you're back on the East Coast and you were sitting with Shimano. But I didn't trust him and uh, somehow I didn't feel comfortable with him and I didn't get taken by Sowen with all that theatric stuff he did. It's like we had a retreat and we used to rent this Episcopalian retreat center in, you know, Tuxedo Park outside of New York. No, I, I don't know. It's a real exclusive place. It's like Rockefeller has an estate there. Uh, Sinclair Oil has an estate there. So that's that's the level it's at, right? And we had we would rent this Episcopalian, yeah. um, what do you call it? Episcopalian retreat center. It was a really beautiful place. So the last night of the retreat, uh, someone says we're going to sit till. 12 o'clock or something, something extra. And then we're going to go out and we, we go out and we start walking around in a circle, right? It's a moonlit night and we've been sitting six days, seven days, whatever it was. And, and so it says, we'll chant to the moon, moo. So we're walking around going, moo. And he has the very uh, bass voice. And he's doing moo, and we're all doing moo. And I really felt funny with it. Like it just seemed a little crazy, you know? It was, <laughs> yeah. We were all new. Essentially, I wouldn't say all of us were new, but all of us were pretty new. There were a few people that were a little more experienced, which probably meant a year or two more. But it, we were new people mostly. And I felt really yeah. weird. I said, man, I hope this stops soon. I don't want to keep doing this. Anyway, it, it eventually stops. I go to my room. Everyone goes to their room. And then someone comes knocking on the door. I get up. I open the door. I said, what is it? And they say, oh, uh, Shirley in, in, in my room is going, is going crazy. I said, what do you mean Shirley's in your She said, yeah, she keeps talking about poison gases coming in through the, the radiators. She says, come help me. Mm. I said, why don't you call Shimano? He <laughs> called me. She says, no, I don't want to wake him. Okay, so I get up and go. And sure enough, this woman's up. And she was a woman. <clears throat> Didn't come to the Zendo much. So she really should not have been on the retreat because she had to be a steady Zendo type to come. But she yeah. had money. She came. She had a wealthy husband and she had some money. So that's why I assume she was there. Anyway, I'm with a woman, and I say, get Shimano. But she doesn't get Shimano, or at least not right away. So I'm with this woman, and I don't want to let her out of the building, because if she gets out of the building, we'll never get her. So I'm kind of talking to her and trying you know, keep her occupied. I'm thinking, why isn't this woman getting Shimano? But she doesn't get Shimano. She never gets Shimano. So I'm with this woman carrying on about poison gas coming in the radiators. And we're kind of walking back around. It's a big place, this retreat center, all with beautiful dark wood. So after about a half an hour, or I don't know how long it was. It's, it's like 12.45 in the morning or something, 1 o'clock. I'm just exhausted. And I'm getting exhausted from trying to keep this woman from going outside. And this other guy, Dickie, walks by to go to the toilet. I say, Dickie, come here. I said, I've been with this woman. She's going crazy with this. She thinks poison gas is coming in here, and she, and she thinks we're being poisoned. So you just have to keep her thing. But whatever you do, don't let her out, because if she gets out, she's going to run away. Don't let her out. I'm going to get Shimano. But stay with her. So I go off to get Shimano, and I leave stupid Dickie with, <laughs> Dickie with this woman who thinks gas is coming in. And I say, Shimano, uh, what's her name? Is She's going crazy. She thinks gas is coming in the radiators. And I've been with her for the last half hour, and I'm, you know, you got to take over. I'm exhausted, and I don't know what to do anyway. And uh, 
He says, crazy American woman. That was his response. Anyway, mm -hmm. he gets up and we go back to where, where I left them. And Dickie is standing in the doorway. He says, she took off. <laughs> I said, Dickie, I told you not to let her out of the building. I said, well, I thought we can go. And she said, oh, look up at the moon. So I looked up at the moon and she took off. So now you have to call the police, right? You have a crazy woman running out in, the, in, in this fancy the state territory. And so the, these detectives came. And uh, anyway, we were on line for the last Sanzen in the morning at the end of the retreat. And, and uh, the detectives come and they take Dickie and they take me because we were the last ones to see her. And Dickie, he's so crazy, this guy. He says, those damn detectives, they blew my can show. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I, was, I thought it was hysterical. I go, Dickie, if, if you didn't let her out the door, your can show wouldn't have been broken. So anyway, that was, then we weren't allowed back there anymore. We used to go to some Catholic, oh. Catholic place in Connecticut. Huh. But she shouldn't have been there, huh. the woman. She, she, um, it was just that they let her go because she had money. Yeah. So how how long did your um, did you stay with Shimano? I probably stayed a year and a half or something. You know, the uh -huh. second year I was there, they were gonna have, they 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 moved, and we got this building that's the, that's their Zen Center now. It used to be an apartment on the west side, and now they have a fancy building on the east side, and so it was going to be the first retreat in that building. So Shimano said, um, Stuart, I want you to be in charge." I said, "Okay," but I knew I was leaving to go up to visit Walters then. And, but I didn't say it right away. But then, and then I had to get uh, some woman to prepare a menu. But there were all this, you know, macrobiotic stuff was big then, so it was vegetarian and all that. So, um, uh, so I had those people picked out, and I was going to get the dishes and then the, 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 and organize everything and that. But at some point, I realized, you know, I'm really going to leave after. I really shouldn't be the one doing this. So I went to Shimano and I told him, Hato, hey, you know, I'm going to leave the center after this. I want to go to the main Zen center. And so maybe you want someone else to do this because maybe I shouldn't be in charge if I'm going to leave right after it. He says, no, I want you to be in charge. I said, okay, but you understand what I'm saying. He says, yeah. I said, okay. So I stayed in charge. And um, I had this woman, I forget her name, she she did the food, she was uh, she did this macrobiotic stuff and that, and some other people to do other stuff. And we had the retreat there, and, and then I left and went to um, Maine. Then I went to Maine, not to... And that was in, uh, what year was that? Seventy. Seventy. Uh, that's when you first met Walter. No, I went up there once before while I was still with Shimano, and I went up there. I wrote him a letter and said that I'd like to come up and da da da. And that I'm with Shimano and I've been practicing blah blah years. It was like, and I, I had been in Tassajara, but I I I want to visit your place. And uh, he said, "Come up." So I came up and. Um, and then he says, "Okay, uh, you could you could come up here, uh, and uh, you know, but you have to move up here. I think he wanted me to move up there. And by then, I was separated from my wife, and um, so uh, I told him all. I, I told him I said I can't come right away." Because Shimano asked me to be in charge of this retreat that they're having, 
And I told him that I'm going up here now, so maybe I'm not the one to do it. But he says he wants me to do it anyway. And so since he wants me to yeah. do it, I'm going to do it. It's, you know, I thought it was like giving back. I, it just seemed like a, it seemed not wise to do it, but fair enough. So I yeah. I stayed to do that. And then after that, I closed out my apartment and then drove up to Maine. But that was 1970. I stayed till 81. And you were there how many years? 11. You were there till 81. And um, now, do you remember a guy named Nils Holm, Danish fellow? Yes, I was friendly with Nils. I liked yeah. him. He was Danish. He was one of my best friends. I liked him. He, You know, I think... You know, David, it's really funny. I got a, I thought he's really charming. And maybe a bit of a bullshitter, but I really yeah. liked him. And I used to go around with him a little. We would drive to somewhere, somewhere. And the women yep. loved him. They loved him. And he used to keep this Danish accent. I used to think, well, I guess if I had the women crawling all over me, I'd keep the accent too. Don't change anything. But uh, I think other people were very jealous of him and didn't like him so much. Really? Oh. Yeah. Huh. Uh, you know, once it was funny. Once uh, someone, there was a guy, I think it was this guy, Mikey, a Japanese guy that was there. And he, we were building some platforms down from the, ro from the path to go down to the Zendo. And it was over this rocky, watery spot. But anyway, Mikey, this Japanese guy, he asked Niels if he could borrow a chisel. So Niels had very good, he sharpened the stuff nicely and he kept everything nice, really good. Yeah. He didn't have like junk, junk stuff. So he gives Mikey one of these chisels. So he comes back, of course, with the the sharpened tip of it all cracked off and broken because Mikey was chiseling wood into the stone steps you know all this kind of stuff right and then he gives it back to Niels and Niels says Mikey you fucked it up <laughs> look at these chisels he had this way of saying chisel that is all drooling and this and that and he says but you fucked it up Mikey and we were all kind of laughing, thinking, Niels, who would give a good chisel to Mikey to hit the chisel on wood on on stone steps like that? So, But I liked him, yeah. Do you remember, was there a woman named Bonnie Miller there? Yeah, I knew Bonnie, Bonnie Miller, I actually knew, and I knew her from before the Zen thing, because she grew up a block away from Is me in Is that Brooklyn. right? We had a football team we started, and her father w wanted to be the coach or something, him and this other guy who was a lawyer. But anyway, so Bonnie's father was. So I knew Bonnie as this. She was younger than me, a few years younger. So, you know, if I was like 17, she was 14 or 13. But so she was a chubby little girl. But then she came up to... Uh, uh, our place in Maine. Um, yeah, I I heard uh, she was she was there. She was with Trunkpa. She might have been with Trunkpa before being there. But I heard it really helped her being at Walters that because he made people be responsible for themselves and you know work and yeah. I have to tell you, though, David, I don't know what your relationship with her was, but she really didn't like working. <laughs> you know, because we used to do, you know, because you couldn't do stuff during the winter because it was ice and snow and uh -huh. the ground was like concrete. It was all frozen. So it all would be during the warmer months and mostly in the summer. And then um, we would get up early and work for like an hour or two and then have breakfast and then go off if you you know if you had a job in town or like that and we were building this road down to the to the zendo from the highway and uh, so it was like wheelbarrow work and 
sad. I just thought that kind of physical. And Bonnie, she just was so resistant to doing it. And then she says, well, I may be big, but I'm not strong. And uh, so she always had some excuse mm. not to do it. So she had that kind of reputation. Yeah, then. yeah. But, but she was friendly with this woman, Madeline. No, but Bonnie and Nels are the only two people I can think of now. They, you know, came from Zen Center and went there. And Nils and I stayed very, very close friends till he died. You know, that was with that thing with it. I was this other guy, Mark Baldwin, and I were friendly there. And uh, we were together once when I went back to visit Maine. I stayed with Mark and we were reminiscing about this or that. And I said, let's call Nils. So somehow I found out that he was in that place in uh, Washington State. I forget the name of it now. Port, Port, Port Townsend. Port Townsend, yeah. And I think he was married there or something, too. Right. Uh, and I called him, and then um, whoever I got or whatever it was, it, somehow I knew that he, was, he had just died, and they were having a memorial service for him. Oh, my God. And he died. He died like that was 2011. Okay, that's when I called him. Wow! I said, "Mark, we're that late. They're having a memorial service for him." Oh yeah. But he seemed healthy yeah. and all that. And um... yeah, he didn't. You know, he, when he got to the age that you're supposed to have colonoscopies, he didn't do it. That's what got him. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He seemed to be like yeah, a I, face around Port Townsend. I, I forget that. Did he do some kind of art stuff? And oh, yeah, yeah. He he was uh, well known in Port Townsend. Uh, his home like made it into, uh, you know, better homes and gardens type magazines and. He totally designed it and built it himself, uh, without any plans or anything. And, and, uh, he just frightened the building inspectors off. And, you know, it was funny. He was very good on that stuff, but he went to do some work with, I think he bought a house or was, had it or whatever. He was supposed to do some work on it. And he really had trouble putting the, or at least he acted like he did, putting the, how to build a scaffolding for it and all of that. Uh, maybe he just pulled the wool over my eyes to get me to help him do it. But uh, anyway, the two of us built this scaffolding together. And I thought, how can Neil be so good on this finished stuff but he doesn't know how to build a scaffolding? But anyway, we did it together. And um, Well, it sounds like he had a bad day because, yeah, he could do anything. Uh, but I really liked him. I went around uh, for one reason or another, and uh, I always enjoyed him. Yeah, yeah, great guy. Yeah. I have a ton on him on Cube.com. He had this yellow v v VW bus. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So after Walter's... What did what happened with you? So I came back to New York, because that's where I'm from, and um, yeah, where the heck was I living? Then? Oh, I was living with this uh, woman who was involved with Tibetan Buddhism, uh, but she had some mental problems, and I was uh, I was much into this uh, um, vitamin stuff and super vitamin stuff. And so mm -hmm. I really, I think I kind of missed how bad she really was. And so mm. um, I actually left at some point because it was just it was too crazy in some way. And I got an apartment in the, uh, this apartment that I'm in now, I have uh, I, I knew to, through work I met these landlords, these two crazy guys from Brooklyn, and they promised to get me an apartment if I would just wait a little while. And then I, they got me this apartment, and I've had it ever since. 
Um, mm. Yeah. And, uh, and mm. then I saw a story, and it must have been in the Village Voice, which is like the East Village or the one of these, you know, papers like that. And, yeah. And uh, it was about um, Shang Yen's uh, meditation center, Chan, Chan Meditation Center in Queens. So I started going out there, and I really liked it. And actually, after about, a, I would say, two months going there, I thought of moving out there and, and live in the building. But then I got sense about me and realized that this would be impossible <laughs> for me to do. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. You know, it was just too repressive in some way. But I stayed with yeah. the center. I, I, I liked the center very much. And it was a different, you know, it didn't have the martial thing that some of the Japanese things had. And we used the, uh, we didn't do the koan study, and there was no koan curriculum. Um, but what it was is we did a wato, which is a Chinese form. And they, in Korean, they call it a wadu, and uh, Japanese call it a wato, W-A-T-O. And uh, this Tawei made it popular in the 12th century. What is it? It's, um, say you have a, a thing. So instead of having a whole koan with an involved story, and where it may also have most of these koans are in these koan collections, like the Mumon Khan, the Blue Cliff Record, the Book of Equanimity, and then Job comments on this, and then the next guy comments on that. So it gets more complicated. It's also very involved with Chinese poetics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the Watteau would be a simple thing. So if you had a, 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 a thing like the Chinese like to chant because they're very much into Amitabha Buddha. So they chant right. Namo Amitabha Buddha. So to make it into a Watteau, to make it like a Chan style of, or a Zen, but the Chan is the Chinese Chan style of meditation, you would focus on um, who. So you'd start out looking at that whole phrase, who is chanting Amitabha Buddha, or who is chanting to Namu Amitabha, who is chanting to Amitabha Buddha. And once you kind yeah. of get in that, then you just focus on the what, on the, on the who rather, I'm sorry. You focus on the who. And the whole, you know, there's a lot of stuff I could, you could read about and write about it and talk about it, but it really is dependent on um, raising doubt or uncertainty. Or yeah, that's what it. Is. So it's based on raising doubt or uncertainty, mm. and so that's the form of meditation. So it's, mm. it's very much simpler. You don't have to go to all these uh, sanzen meetings that you do. And the koan curriculum, you know, in the Rinzai thing, is really a curriculum. Each monastery has their own curriculum, what koans they use, you know, how many and all of that stuff, and accepted answers even. But this thing, you stay with that one thing. Uh, who, is, uh, who is repeating the uh, Dhamma Lama Taba? And then you uh -huh. focus on the who, and you try and raise doubt with it, or the doubt sensation, or the sensation of uncertainty. Mm. And when that gets going, and that's uh, when you really get into that kind of meditation, it um, uh, everything else drops away. And so it's it's a whole thing that, uh, and if you could stay with it and that, then you could have some kind of uh, quote unquote breakthrough, and you have like a Chan experience or a Zen experience. Mm -hmm. But you don't mm. need, you know, and you could do it. It's uh, Da Wei who popularized it. He kind of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, he. Um, he was interested in awakening, that people should have awakening. So he didn't necessarily stress sitting on the cushion as much as having the awakening. And his, But you could see his students, or at least he had students that were monks like others, but he also had many students that were kind of uh, what they call the uh, shi tai fu, the literati of China that 
took these uh, three-day tests uh, to get jobs in the civil service and to become administrators in the Chinese system. So these people were very highly learned. They had to know Confucian poetics. They had to know all kinds of stuff. Um, and so, but they they trust. They really had a very rational kind of mind, and those kind of a their a, a, a way of looking at things were from a very rational perspective. And that way, thought that was a problem. And so this this uh, Watto, what's called the Watto, or uh, yeah, you you focus on that and you try and raise this sensation of uncertainty, and all this other stuff drops away. And so it's a very, uh, uh, you, you really find how subtle these kind of little uh, holding on to things and uh, and not to generate what he called backup stories, um, like that, yeah. So it's a very mm. good, I think it's, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, I do it, so that's one thing I'm, 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 but I don't think it's better than anything else. I think it suits some people very well. So I think I'm mm-hmm. one of the people mm-hmm. that I feel suited for it. And when I, the minute I started it, I felt like this This is good. I like this and it fits me. Um, mm. But you could do it all during the day. You could do it while you, you know, depending on your work, you could do it how you spend your day. There's a lot of room to do it where you don't, you don't have to be sitting mm-hmm. on your cushion and that. Well, the, the oldest... Uh, Koan, it seems to me, is who am I that comes out of Hinduism. Yeah, but they do it a little different. That uh, Ramana Maharshi uses that who am I. But I think he uses it in a slightly different way. But um, uh-huh. anyway, this is uh, there's some great books out on it now. That um, You know this guy Jeffrey Broughton? So he has three three books that have come out that uh, they're they're really good. What do? Yeah, he does. It's not called that. They have different names. One's called the Chan Whip, which is interesting. That was meant to be a kind of book that you carry around with you as a uh, I forget what you you know we like a reminder and a thing that you can look at and you can keep it in your robe. And Haku and about was very fond of that. The John Whip one, but um, this uh, this other one that is I, I really like very much is the recorded sayings of Chan Master Zhang Fang Ming Ben, and then there's mm. another one he has on that um, core text of the Sun approach, which is um, the Korean approach. So it has. Uh, it has stuff on other Chinese people too, but it's a, it was a book put together by someone that was uh, in the in the Korean tradition. So he took stuff from the Chinese and the Korean and made a compendium of that. But they're all terrific. Wow. And, uh, and Broughton's a wonderful translator. So I I feel really lucky that in the last few years these uh, things have come out and that. I've I found every you know I really everything that he says is I found with my own experience that matches it well, and mm. um, this Ming Ben one I really like very much. So, but I like the three of them, and the, you know, so it's, uh, yeah. it's very lucky to have it because there was none of this stuff around for, uh, until a few years ago. Uh, that's something we you're you you know we've gone uh, for like. Uh, Two hours and twenty minutes now, uh, and um, you sort of come full circle back. This is you have a very impressive uh, spiritual mm, story, you know, like how it's progressed. And uh, I'd, I'd say uh, there's your spiritual practice, but there's also been your your writings uh you know sort of showing the 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 you know the problems that develop with uh uh gurus and all that 
And, uh, I want to, I want to deal with you some on, uh, th- through email and make sure that's represented well enough. I have links to some of your stuff on cuke.com. Yeah. One thing that's always struck me is how resistant Zen people are to seeing things as they are, really are. They don't want to know. And the Tibetans are worse. <laughs> it's, it's, um, they just don't want to know it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. Um, and, and You can't say that is true of everybody. I mean, there's plenty no, of people. No, it's definitely, that are... of course not. There's a lot of people that want to. Um, and the Tibetan thing, it gets very complicated because big name people endorse people that have just had trouble. Yeah. Well, the, the whole, the whole endorsing each other, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Uh, and, uh, in, anyway, I think you've, I, 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 you've done a good job of, uh, our, uh, of, uh, you know, you tried to expose the underbelly of it, uh, and some of the problems with, you know, I don't know, people believe a lot of shit, you know, and they, they close their minds, um, and it's especially it's a problem when when people start just taking everything some teacher says as the gospel truth. And <laughs> you know, we used to joke about that. There were some people in Maine that used to say, "Well, Walter said." Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize Walter said that. You know, it's sort of like uh-huh. like a thunderbolt came down from heaven. Walter said, "So it was a joke." Some of us. Well, obviously, Walter had something going for him, uh, but uh, you know, he ran into there's a lot of train wrecks in the in the field. Uh, but um, uh, listen, uh, do you have anything? Uh, you want to say in conclusion? Because I think we'd better wrap it up here. Okay, let's wrap it up. And you said you're going to. That's, you know. So that would be good, David. This has been an enjoyable conversation. Yeah. Well, your your um, uh, web, website is growing. I mean, it's much bigger than what I remember it. It seems more organized than I remember it. Well, you can thank Peter Ford for that. <laughs> you know, there's a guy that we that I was friend. Excuse me, that I was friendly with, and I was Peter Schneider. Oh, sure, Peter Schneider has a group in he and Jane. You know, they've been married forever, and they have a group in Northridge in uh, Los Angeles, and they're great. And what about his brother Jigs? I, I don't know what's happening with Jig right now. He's told me. I've been in touch with Peter. But you knew Jig. How did you know? I don't know. Actually, I was friendlier with, I was friendlier with Jig than with Peter. What, what, did you know him on the East Coast? No, I met him in San Francisco. And uh, we seemed to get on. It's like yeah. Esteban. I met Esteban. And there was another guy that was, there were three of us. There was Esteban, myself, and this third guy that was married to a woman that was going to Berkeley. He didn't even know what she was majoring in. And uh, they, he let me stay with them for a while. And, and we'd eat, his wife would make some breakfast that was all very, like, uh, very uh, organic, let's say, right? And then after mm-hmm. she left, we'd go out and, and he would <laughs> get bacon and eggs and something else. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, it was very funny. And uh, that was, yeah. <laughs> I forget his name, though. They lived in a garage building in Berkeley or something, I forget. And were they involved with the Zen Center? Or? Yeah, I met them at this. I met him at this. She wasn't, didn't seem as involved, but he seemed more. He was a very nice fellow, uh-huh. too. I can't, for the life of me, I thought his name would pop up now, but I'm, it's it's not happening. Wait, you might think of it later and send it in an email. Okay. Uh Anyway, thanks a lot, Stuart. This has uh, really been fun talking with you. And yeah, yeah, you've been 
Yeah, you've got uh, had quite a journey, and it, it seems to to be continuing. Yeah, I got uh, you know we have a little reading group, myself and three other guys, and we it's partially social. We schmooze for a while, and then we have we always have make some assignment for reading each week. And uh, mm. it's a real nice combination, and the the four of us are all very different. So it's a, it's a, I really appreciate this uh, group that we have. It's very nice. Mm. Well, that's good. I think there's lots of stuff around like that that's just not, you know, uh, what do you call it? it? It's not a public institution kind of thing. Yeah. Or it's very yeah. small and it doesn't get on the radar on that, but uh, this is very nice. I really en- en- enjoy it and value uh, the group that we have together. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. I like I like the small groups. Okay. Well, you take care, Stuart. Okay. Bye now. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Take care. So uh, thanks, uh, Stuart Lacks. That was uh, very interesting. I wonder what we lost. Um, hmm. You know, I, I record these things two different ways. And each way I recorded saved a different part. One of them got the first of it. And the other one didn't even get the first of it. Uh, and the the first one that gets the first... That goes to the break, and then the other one starts sometime after that. I don't know. might not have been that long. And the weird thing, this uh, faulty um, uh, USB, uh, I assume it's the cause of of both the problems. I know it's the cause of it cutting out and losing some, but we kept losing uh, the connection, too. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, I still think it came out pretty good. Oh, and, uh, one thing, um, I think I got all the costs out of this one. Um, boy, I need to find artificial intelligence transcriber that'll, um, that'll transcribe coughs. I mean, just say like in parentheses or in brackets, cough, uh, then I could search for him that way. And and uh, the reason was, if, if you happen to have heard what I said last week, is that uh, in, in making these, I hit mute on my microphone. And then, it's true, the party I was talking to couldn't hear it. And I assumed that it would also not be going on the tape. And it took me a little bit to figure that out. So there's, and, and it happened at a time I had bronchitis or was, mm, it was not the worst part of it. But so there's a certain number of podcasts where I'm coughing and I think it's muted so I don't make any attempt to turn my head or anything. And uh, uh, anyway, I, I think I got them all this one. This is one of the podcasts that was in that period Okay, so listen, Stuart, thanks a lot. You take care. Keep up the good work. And until next time, this is DC, Puba, and Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Doggett Bandita, guest Doggett Boom Boo. Or Boombita. <laughs> and a new, our new arrival that the two doggets, uh, well, the the little one, the toy poodle that's uh, we're keeping for some friends, she had no trouble with the cat from the first because she's smaller, much smaller than the cat. <laughs> sort of a big cat. Uh, it was a, a rescue cat uh, that some, uh, some people, actually that we don't know, that, uh, but lived uh, very near us. 
uh, had uh, picked up picked up um, on the side of a road in Australia, you know, five years ago or something, in a plastic bag. It was just a little kitten, and so uh, you know they were back here in Bali, and uh, the woman ran into some serious health problems, and they flew back to Australia, and you know put a, a note on uh, Facebook, Sanur or something. And uh, so Katrinka wanted a replacement for her dear Coochie, who died a year ago yesterday on December 25th. I think on the night of December 25th under our bed. And Coochie had been with us, uh, mm, uh, uh, oh God, how long? Five, uh, nine years. No, well, sort of. I mean, she started off just a feral cat that lived near where we did. And um, we got tired of her having babies that, you know, wouldn't last. Uh, and got her fixed and everything. It was still, uh, she was still pretty feral. Um, we had to get um, rabies, sh rabies shots uh, <laughs> from the early <laughs> days with her. <laughs> She claw and bite, not not really being hostile or anything. She just didn't know how to behave right, and uh, didn't realize the results of what she was doing on our very tender skin. Anyway, okay, okay. So the new cat's name is Manis, which means sweet, and things are beginning. Bundy's uh, getting to where she's getting used to her. For the first time, Bondi slept in the bedroom with us last night and did not get up and tag <laughs> Bondi. No, I've never seen any cat uh, that Bondi got the that Bondi got the best of. She'll stop if they stop. And uh, she just likes to sort of chase them and she thinks it's her, her purpose in life. But she and Gucci got along great. Oh, and but see, she came as a little puppy to us when Coochie was already full grown. So they played and just were best of friends. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. So look, uh, Bondi, Boom Boo, and, and uh, Manis, dear lovely Katrinka, and I uh, wish you and yours. A grand awakening.